is uh, going to be one which has what I would call many eggshells in it that I've determined to take out the jackboots and stomp all over those eggshells and we'll see how we go the title is so let's be before we be, uh, start we'll we'll have a prayer dear Lord we are going to address a topic today that's going to be quite tough we pray and you'll please continue to be with my thoughts that whatever is said is going to give honor and glory to you and that the message will help us all to be better in our aim to come closer to you that we may be ready for that time when you come to take your people home in Jesus name amen the title of my talk today is called destroying Christianity with racism one thing the devil wants to do more than anything else is to separate us from God the story of Job makes that clear once he has separated us from God he can impose all kinds of degeneracies upon us and leave us to be abject moral wrecks who are made to try who are made to try to follow rules that are impossible to follow not only that but he also creates moral frameworks that are impossible to prove to those looking on that you are faithful to those frameworks one of the things that the God haters of this world have been doing is to search for ways in which to turn our desire for moral good against us so that they may have power over us it has been my observation that they have been spectacularly successful in this endeavor especially since the start of mass media you may have heard individually stories getting around about how the devil boasts that television is his most effective tool against Adventists just how important it is for the God haters to separate us from our Bibles becomes clear when we consider stories related by a pastor Jack that I knew from North New South Wales Adventist Conference he related many years ago how he found himself in a radio studio with a spiritualist debating the state of the dead the first thing he did was to assert that all answers he was going to provide that night would be from the Bible and that the Bible was the final source of authority regarding all matters of the state of the dead by the time he left that program he was almost kissing the Bible given the way it was so effective in answering all points put out by the spiritualist so effective that the spiritualist made a comment wishing that he could somehow get rid of that Bible the point being that by solidly standing upon biblical authority the enemy had no answer many of you who have taken the time to engage evolutionists will be able to think of at least one occasion on which they will demand that you leave the Bible out of the discussion the God haters of the world hate God's Word that is the Bible what will you do when you asked by your God hating opponents to leave the Bible out of it well the Bible has this to say about this matter if we go to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 and we then read the following small passage and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God now I kind of like the Hebrews a little better even though it's it, because it tells you what the sword of the Spirit does Just excuse me for a second Hebrews 4 verse 12 and it says this for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword 
piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So as you can see, the Bible is effectively God's weapon. So in answer to your opponent, you have to bear in mind that you must reject their requests because what he is do asking you to do is to disarm yourself when he demands that you leave the Bible out of the discussion. Now, God had an answer to the impact of mass media. And it was a great one. What he did was he used the fears of man to create something that would frustrate the plans of the powers that be by taking control away from mass media. And one of the biggest fears that was occurring by in the powers that be at the time was the possibility of the destruction of communication should nuclear war occur. So the scientists of the head of the day, sorry, put their heads together and came up with a successful solution to this communications problem. This solution is now known as the internet. Now George Soros, who I'm pretty sure many of you have heard of, is on the record, and I've actually seen him say it, stating regret for the creation of the internet. Now he didn't go into why that was, but if we look at what's happening in the world today, it's becoming quite clear. It has allowed others to do an end run around the mass media and the control of the information. And as a consequence, they're able to get their message out to younger generations who do a lot more information gathering from the internet than they do from mass media. Now, the unfortunate thing with this attack upon the world was the lies that have been promoted. So you, some of you may have heard of the Frankfurt School of Cultural Marxism. It is from there that the lies of egalitarianism, feminism and racism came. It is worth noting that the Bible mentions nothing of these concepts. In fact, the Bible is a hierarchical book. And what this can only mean is that if these concepts are not to be found in the Bible, then their own origins can only come from the depths of hell and are dressed in a Christian skin suit so that Christianity and those within will accept the baleful ideologies found within. Now the question is, have these ideas taken hold within the Adventist community and the Christianity at large? It is my observation that they have. First came the acceptance of feminism, which became an entering wedge for women's ordination into most denominations. Hot on the heels of women's ordination came the push for the acceptance of homosexuality. This too has been largely successful. The trajectory has continued to follow the push into transgenderism and it's on its way into the push for the acceptance of pedophilia. And I'm sure that you are witnessing with rising anger the way these de degeneracies, oh, sorry, degeneracies are being imposed upon society at large and on the Adventist community specifically. But now I'm going to focus on one particular hot button issue that has not been addressed by anybody and it's something that we should be somewhat angry about and that issue is racism. Now, now that I've mentioned it, I want you to think to yourself, 
what kind of image forms in your head when I make the following statement? I met a racist yesterday. Okay, think to yourself, what would such a person look like? What skin colour, eye colour and hair colour do they have? What ethnic background do they have? What religious ancestry are they most likely to hail from? What is their hairstyle? How about tattoos? What kind of vehicle do they most likely drive? Now, if your image fits what I understand to be the stereotype, then you are probably thinking of a male, white skin, blue eyes, straight hair, European ancestry, Protestant religious background, quite likely a skinhead driving a large pickup truck of some description. Now, if this be the stereotypical image that you have in mind, then congratulations. You share this image with a large majority of the population. Notice there is no person from any other ethno-ancestry in such an image. Given that racism has deemed, been deemed a moral evil by the population at large, this stereotype can only mean now that the word racist in its various permutations now has anti-white overtones. Now, if you go... If you doubt this, go and take a look and Google for the term straight white male or cis white heterosexual male. The straight white male is the... No, I'll take a look at... I'll just look at this uh, uh, panel. And I got this from the Urban Dictionary. And the Urban Dictionary is a good place to go if you come across any new terminology that you don't know about. You'll quite often find it there. And you'll notice here that it says it is... I will look at definition number two. A person who is of male sex, white skin colour and is heterosexual but is also lazy, racist, misogynistic and or has other negative attributes commonly used by radical feminists. So as you can see... Um, the straight white male is the winner of the Oppressor Olympics. Not the Oppression Olympics, but the Oppressor Olympics. But is this attack on the white race simply going after the white race for its behaviour? Well, the answer is both yes and no. Yes, the anti-whites are going after the white race for the behaviour of our ancestors. But the real target is the Christian faith, which has been a large part of the white race since Protestant days. And that has been the problem. Now, if you doubt this, I'm going to just show you a panel which comes from the National Museum of African American History and Culture, who wants to make you aware of certain signs of whiteness, individualism, hard work, objectivity, the nuclear family, progress, respect for authority, delayed gratification and more. Now, as far as more is going concerned, this particular graphic got deleted from the internet two days after it was made public by this person. So I had to go hunting for it and I did manage to find it. And let's take a quick look at it. So this comes from that same crowd. And you can see there their um, acronym at the top. So it's talking about aspects and assumptions of whiteness. And we'll spend a bit of time going through this because I want to hammer into your minds the idea that what they're really attacking is Christianity. So aspects of, and assumptions of whiteness and white culture in the United States. Sorry. White dominant culture or whiteness refers to the way white people and their traditions, attitudes and ways of life have been normalized over time and are now considered standard practice in the United States. And since white people still hold most of the institutional power in America, we've all internalized some aspects of white culture, including people of color. So you notice that they're setting their standards 
as being a white culture thing rather than a religious thing. But let's take a quick look at some of the elements in here. Number one, rugged individualism. The individual is the primary unit. Self-reliance, independent and autonomy, highly valued and rewarded. Individuals seem to be con in control of their environment. You get what you deserve. You think about that. That is really Christianity. Because we have always preached all of our lives in Adventism that we all get to heaven based upon our individual relationship with Christ our Saviour. When we faced exams, this uh, premise came through. Everyone got to pass or fail based upon their own efforts. Now look at the thing about family structure. The nuclear family, father, mother and 2.3 children is the ideal social unit. Husband is the breadwinner and head of the household, wife is homemaker and subordinate to the husband. Children should have own rooms. Now, you've got to understand, these things look good on the face of it. But you have to understand, this is coming from a group of people that are trying to attack this and demonise it and make it bad. Let's take a look at the scientific method. Objective, rational, linear thinking, cause and effect relationships, quantitative emphasis. And what about history? Based on Northern European immigrants' experience in the United States, heavy focus on the British Empire, the primacy of Western, Greek, Roman and Judeo-Christian tradition. Protestant work ethic. Hard work is the key to success. Work before play. If you didn't meet your goals, you didn't work hard enough. Okay? Do we find those things in the Bible? I argue that we do. All right? Religion. Christianity is the norm. Good. Anything other than Judeo-Christian tradition is foreign. No tolerance for deviation from single God concept. Now, in my eyes, that's a good thing. But for them, it is a negative and should be destroyed in whatever means possible. Now, this are, these other ones I'm a bit ambivalent towards, but I'll, we'll go through them anyway. Status, power and authority. Wealth equals worth. Your job is who you are. Respect authority. Okay, I go, certainly de definitely go with that. Heavy value on ownership of goods, space, property. One of the things that you'll find in the Christian ethic is a high regard for private property. And we could go into that at another time if anyone was interested. Uh, future orientation. Plan for the future. Delayed gratification. Progress is always best. Tomorrow will be better. And time. Follow rigid time schedules. Time viewed as a commodity. All right. You'll see that these are all Christian. And, and we support those ideas as Christian. Ascetics. Based on European culture. Steak and potatoes. Bland is best. Women's beauty is based on blonde, thin Barbie. Man's attractiveness based on economic status, power and intellect. Okay, well, I can't say a real lot about those. Um, though I think the ascetics, we do certainly as humans appreciate beauty and we do appreciate attractiveness. And one of the things that uh, has been noted by many observers in society is that in spite of the push for fat acceptance and uh, various other things, that they have not been able to change a man's preference for the kind of kind of woman he would prefer in the same way that a woman has not changed her preferences for the kind of man she prefers. Holidays based on Christian religions. Well, that's not a problem. Based on white history and male leaders. Okay. Whoops. Justice based on English common law. Protect property and entitlements intent counts so in other words the when they say intent so if I say something offensive but I did not mean it in an offensive matter then I'm supposed to be the one that determines whether or not it was offensive not the person hearing what was said but in recent times it's supposed to be the way that the receiver of that statement is going to 
perceive it. If they perceive it as offensive, then according to society these days, or some elements of society, you, the one who said the thing, is the one that committed the crime. Now, regardless of what your intent is. Now, the thing I notice here is when you look at English common law, English common law is very much based upon uh, scripture. There, you can, there are at times in scripture where you see what has to be done and what has to be ruled when they, people don't know what to do and they, they uh, then go to God and ask, well, what should we do? And that happens in the time of Moses. So English common law seems to run on the same kind of ethic. And of course, yes, you do protect property and entitlements, but there seems to be an effort to get away from property protection. Okay, competition, B number one. Well, what does that mean? Well, you can look at that in a good way and a bad way. B number one means to aim for the highest possible standard. Now, to aim for the highest possible standard, I would consider to be very desirable, given God's attitude towards perfection. Uh, win at all costs, win or lose a dichotomy, action, orientation, master and control nature. Now, win or lose a dichotomy is about making choices and then, and then experiencing the consequences of those choices. And that, that is one way of uh, that make, being a, a good thing. Uh, action, orientation, master and control nature. Must always do something about a situation. Aggressiveness and extroversion. Decision making. Majority rules. And finally, communication. The King's English rules. In other words, a standard written tradition. Avoid conflict intimacy. Don't show emotion. Don't discuss personal life. Be polite. Okay. Now. Some of these things are very much biblical base. In fact, I would say the majority of the things that I've pointed out here in this graphic are things that you should very strongly consider as far... Oops. Oh dear. I'm sorry. I've just blasted my thing out. Um, let's bring that up again. So we don't need to look any more at this. Um, there we go. I'll look at we'll look at this one in a moment. Okay. So where does that leave us? Well, you look at this chart that was that you've just seen, and it's very clear that the powers that be have Christianity in their sights. So why do they dress it up in anti-white terminology? The answer is twofold. Number one, Christianity is too deeply embedded across the nations and races to make a direct Christian attack viable. Number two, the Christian ideology was mostly spread across the world by white Protestant people and still is being so. And now they must be punished for having done so. And I imagine you could think of a particular organisation that would want to do that. Okay, so what do we do? Well, the powers that be have invented a new moral framework which we now recognise as being um, racism. That's the best name I can give it. Uh, most people in this day and age have been so affected by this, so successfully affected by this, that they will cringe at being called a racist. And they'll immediately come up with all sorts of defences. But I have non-white friends. I'm married to a non-white. And the list will go on. I think a lot of people must have been aware of the attack on Christianity that the above chart was attempting to do because two days later after the chart was published 
we got the following news article. We'll see if that will come up. No, not that one. Um, okay. All right. I can't. It's not coming up at the moment. But, but what I'll do. Oh, yeah, I know what happened. Oh, there we go. It has the title. Smithsonian Museum apologizes for saying that hard work and rational thought is white culture. So they put the graphic up and then two days later they took it down. So it turns out that the organization that produces it is part of the Smithsonian Museum. So that, that was coming in from quite a big um, location. If you take a look at this it says National Museum of African American history and culture, which was the graphic that I just showed you before, or where it came from. The National Museum of African American History and Culture is a Smithsonian Institute museum located in the National Mall in Washington, D.C. It was established in December 2003, opened its permanent home in September 2016, with a ceremony led by Barack Obama. So that's where it came from. And obviously, they are very anti-Christian. Well, they can apologise all they wish, but the cat is out of the bag. The white race is being attacked for the way it successfully spread Christianity through the world. It is now in the interest of Christians of all races to come together and defend the white race. If non-whites refuse to do so, they may well be unfitting themselves for heaven. Imagine being in heaven and finding yourself beside a people group that you despise as a race here on earth. I don't think that's going to work somehow. Now lest you think this is all about the white race and nothing to do with Christianity, I want you to take a look at what happened in Russia as it turned away from atheism and headed towards Christianity. Yeah, I think I had it here a moment ago. Oh, yes. Here it is. Okay. I think I'll blow this up a bit bigger so it'll be a bit easier for you to see. Okay. Now, the bit that is of interest is, um, is being highlighted. If you've got a bit of time, you can probably take a quick look at the... Um, at uh, some of the stuff up the top or above. But in 2005, in Russia, Putin had a major program of church construction commenced and the numbers attending church began to grow. Putin made it clear that he regarded orthodoxy as Russia's national religion. And this is rather interesting because communism up until then had been all about atheism. And the church was accorded a favoured legal position. And such symbolic gestures were backed by new legislation which began to transform Russian society. The country's abortion laws, hitherto some of the most liberal in the world, were tightened. In October 2011, the Russian parliament passed a law restricting abortion to the first 12 weeks of pregnancy, with an exception up to 22 weeks if pregnancy was the result of rape. The new law also made mandatory a waiting period of two to seven days before an abortion could be performed to allow a woman to reconsider her position. During this period, the portrayal of Russia in Western media moved from one of condescension to outright hostility. As early as 2005, scholars Ira Strauss and Edward Lozansky remarked upon a pronounced negative coverage of Russia in the US media, contrasting negative media sentiment with the largely positive sentiment of the American public and US government. 
as Russia displayed increasing signs of a Christian revival, so the media reporting in the West became increasingly hostile. Only rarely, however, did journalists openly attack Russia for its Christianization. Normally, columnists conscious of the fact that large numbers of people in the West continue to describe themselves as Christian portrayed their anti-Russian commentary as the result of Russia's aggression, corruption or lack of democracy. All that, however, changed with the new abortion law of 2011. Now the attacks against Russia became explicitly ideological. The Russians, we were told... Sorry, I'll just try and run that up a bit. Okay, there we are. The Russians, we were told, were oppressing women and turning their backs on progress. It was not until, until 2013, however, that the anti-Russian rhetoric went hyperbolic. In that year, the Russian parliament passed its so-called anti um, gay proper sorry pass it so called gay propaganda law. The bill described as protecting the children from information harmful to their health and development explicitly banned gay pride parades as well as other forms of LGBT material such as books and pamphlets which attempt to normalize homosexuality and to influence children in their attitudes to homosexuality. Yeah, no, okay. In actual fact, since around 2006, many districts in Russia had been imposing their own local bans on such material, though these rules had no power outside their own restriction, or jurisdiction. The bill, which was signed into law by Putin on June 30, 2013, was extremely popular and passed through the Russian parliament unanimously with just one abstention. But the impact upon the Western nomenclatura, and I had to look that up, it actually means um, elite, who formed the gatekeepers of acceptable opinion, was immediate. Almost unanimously, Western media outlets now began to compare Putin with Adolf Hitler. He was a thug, a fascist, a murderer. <clears throat> okay. Well, so as you can see, the attack is not an attack on the white race, it, although that's just simply part of the agenda. It's out there to try and destroy Christianity and to punish the white race for their spread of Christianity around the world. And one of the ways that they've done that, let's go back to Karl Marx. Karl Marx created the paradigm of the oppressor and the oppressed. Take a look at all the various degeneracies you see around the world today and you'll almost see an oppressor, oppressed ideology being used to promote them. This is part of the reason as to why Russia is being attacked so heavily today by the West. They turned away from the oppressor, oppressed ideology of communism and have been turning back toward Christianity. Now, let's take a look at the couple of th these things that have been uh, bothering us. In the mind of the feminist, the patriarch is the oppressor. In the mind of the anti-white, the racist, which is commonly understood to be the white these days, is the oppressor. So you can be a double oppressor and be a cis straight white male. As you can see, the attack on the white is part of the larger attack on Christianity. And regrettably, the Globo Homo has been successful in engaging the services of many anti-white Christians in attacking the white race, not realising that this attack is in part aimed at themselves. So what is the answer to this problem? Well, let's take a look. Well, 
Okay, the answer is going to be multifaceted. The first step is to realize that the Bible is a hierarchical book and not an egalitarian one. Once this comes to the attention of the egalitarians, they will leave. They will choose their God-hating, communist-inspired egalitarianism over what the Bible has to say. The next step is to make the attacks on the white race immoral in the eyes of those who would make such attacks. This will frustrate the efforts of those who would try and destroy Christianity using the angle of racism. Now, the slide that I'm showing you now were, is actually an invention by the gentleman standing in the picture. He is, goes by the name of Anthony Johnson. And he compares, you may see it there, it's not, but not exactly clear, a lot of ladies wearing pink hats. And some of you may even know the name they have for those hats, which I won't state here. But he referred to them and compared them to the KKK on the right-hand side, and he referred to the ones on the left as being the pink KKK. And it elicited a very strong reaction from that group of people. In other words, this is what we call rhetoric, where you pin a particular label to a group of people. The label can be positive, it can be negative, but it, at the end of the day is rhetoric. Now, when it comes to specifically to the white race, there has to be a much larger, bigger counter-offensive against the anti-white rhetoric aimed in our direction. What brought me to this conclusion is watching the rhetoric ramp up in the gender world and also in the racial world. And I've alluded to the ramp up that occurred in the, uh, in the gender world earlier on where we're trying to push our way towards acceptance of pedophilia. Now, consider the way in which the ramp-up has been occurring in the racial world. I wanted, to, I wanted to defend myself against that charge because I don't like to be called a racist. So the first thing I say is I have non-white friends. Well, that used to be a shield against charges of racism, but no longer. What about those who say, I have non-white family and in-laws? Well, that is no longer a shield against charges of racism. But what about the Bible? Is the Bible racist? Well, some might argue that it is because it associates the good with light, implying white, while that which is associated with evil is darkness, implying non-white. We have reached a ridiculous situation in the world now where we're at the stage I'm aware of one non-white in a work environment who accused her non-white superiors of racism. Now, I hate to think what would have happened if her superiors were indeed white. The amount of effort put into investigating such a crime would have been orders of magnitude larger than it turned out to be, proving that the word racist is now an anti-white word. What is even more revealing is when you ask the anti-whites what a non-racist society would look like, they will not be able to give an answer. If you ask how can we know if racism has been banished from society and that all the activists can go home and look for something else to do, they will not be able to answer that either. In essence, the campaign against racism has no endpoint, and that is by design. But if you look at life in normal, you'll find virtually every aspect of life does have an endpoint. You go to school for 12 years and you get a certificate. The certificate is the endpoint. Tell a child to get dressed in the morning. The end point is when the dressing is complete. 
if you get to and wash the dishes in the kitchen. There arrives a point at which there are no more dirty dishes. But you go and try and find an end point for the push against racism. There is none. As such, it must be made clear by those in favour of white well-being that while there is no end point for racism, that there will be no further support coming from those in favour of white well-being. What then has to be done is to morally demonise the anti-whites and expose them for the haters of the white race that they have become. How has this demonisation occurred? Well, quite simply, they are pointing at the actions of the ancestors of today's white people and demanding that today's white people should feel guilty for whatever it was that their own ancestors did. Now my daughter had this kind of experience when she was going to school. So they, uh, they had an excursion down to the Asian centre in, um, in the centre of town where they've got that Asian street. I forgot what they call it. But there's a museum there. And that museum focuses on the history of Asians within Australia. So she went there. She enjoyed it very much. She came home and she told me about it. And as she was talking to me about it, she spoke about how Australians did do some bad things against Asians at the time. And these things were recorded in the museum. And it was true. I knew of these things. But her response to being told about those things was most enlightening to me. At the time, she says, it makes me feel guilty. Now, at that time, I said, I can't have that. I can't have you being feeling guilty for what people of former generations did. And I said to her, the Bible teaches us that we're not supposed to be guilty for the sins of our parents. And I said, and even if, uh, and even if we, they, even if you were supposed to be, your ancestors had nothing to do with the things that happened against Asians in Australia. One of them came through New Zealand, and the another one came through Papua New Guinea. There is no connection between you, as you are today and any of the bad things that happened to Asian people at the time. So, why the push? Why is the push only happening in Western nations? Well, Stephen Molyneux at one time said the only reason it's happening in Western nations is because they're the only nations rich enough to do a shakedown on. In other words, <clears throat> give us some money and the racism will go away, or the uh, accusations thereof. Okay. Now that I've given you a bit of background, well, what's the first offence a Christian should take in charges of racism, especially ancestral racism? Because these charges of racism will come when you refuse to push or promote the anti-white gen agenda. And this first offence should come straight out of the Bible. Now, because I have not been separated from my Bible, my first response will come from the Bible and will come out of Ezekiel chapter 18 and it will start at verse 2. Verse 2 starts, What mean ye that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. And now we're going to go through a list of things that God describes the ancestors having done. And as you will see, they are not pleasant. As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul of that sinneth, it shall die. But 
If a man be just and do what is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted his, up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbour's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with an ar- a garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase that hath withdrawn his hand from the iniquity, hath executed true judgment between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just, he shall surely live, saith the Lord God. Now, if he beget a son, this is verse 10, if he beget a son, that is a robber, a shedder of blood, and that doeth the like to any one of these things, and that doeth not any of those duties, but even hath eaten upon the mountains, and defiled his neighbour's wife, has oppressed the poor and needy, hath spoiled by violence, hath not restored the pledge, and hath lifted up his eyes to the idols, hath committed abomination, hath given forth upon usury, and hath taken increase, shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations. He shall surely die, his blood shall be upon him. Now lo, if he beget a son, that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth and doeth not such like, that hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither lifted his eyes up to idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbour's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholden the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury or increase, hath executed my judgments, hath walked in my statutes, he shall not die for the iniquity of his father, he shall surely live. As for his father, because he cruelly oppressed, spoiled his brother by violence, and did that which is not good among his people, lo, even he shall die in his iniquity. And in summary, yet say ye, why? Doth not the son bear the iniquity to father? Well, when the son hath done that which is lawful and right, and hath kept all my statutes, and hath done them, he shall surely live. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him him. So what this means when you have people coming to you telling you to feel guilty for what your ancestors did, you can tell them to take a hike using this biblical passage as your source of authority. Should they then respond by accusing you of being racist for supporting, sorry, for refusing to support their agenda, your immediate response then is accuse them of being anti-white. You can further go on to ask them if they favour white well-being. If they say no, you can immediately accuse them of being in favour of white harm. And interestingly enough, they will use the same defence strategies that white people have used to show that they were not racist. That is, I have white friends, I'm married to a white, I have white relatives. Do not accept that as their defence. Accuse them using, of using those points as a way of covering up their anti-whiteness. Now, there are a lot more talking points and lexicon that need to be brought to bear upon this attack, but I can say this. By protecting the white race, you will also be protecting the Christianity to which you now subscribe and was brought to you and me, by the white man. May God bless his word.